people engaged. Um, so, you know, let me do this. Uh, let's do this formally. Dot. I'd like to introduce you and then we'll, we'll get rolling. So um, thanks everybody for joining tonight. Um, I'd love to introduce our speaker. It's Todd Spire. He's the founder, head guide and instructor at Asopus Creel. That's a full service outfit, outfitter located in Phoenicia, New York. For anyone who's not familiar, that's that's a bit north of what a lot of people tend to associate with uh, Catskills fishing, like the Delawares, the beaver and the willow. Um, it's really in the heart of the mountains. Um, <clears throat> and while those streams that I just mentioned get a lot more attention to the south, they get a lot more attention. I think the the Esopus, and I think you're going to learn tonight that the Esopus is a pretty unique little river. Um, and I, at this point, you know, just kind of following Todd on social media and having met him a couple times at the shop when my wife Megan and I go out that way, I don't think there's anyone right now that possesses the knowledge uh, of that watershed that Todd does. So that was kind of, you know, the impetus for, you know, asking him to join us tonight. Um, so he really speaks very passionately about the river, knows a tremendous amount about it, and beyond just the knowledge, uh, Todd is a really a, a true champion for the wild rainbow population that's found in the East. So for folks that don't understand that, you're gonna learn tonight that, you know, it really um, is a, a kind of a stronghold for wild rainbows um, as far as uh, streams and rivers go in New York State. Um, so he's gonna talk a little bit about some of the events and management practices that are impacting the river now and that will continue to do so in the future. And um, he's an all-around cool guy. You know, I, I follow Instagram, and I think I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw you on a skateboard, um, you know, doing tricks on a skateboard like a couple months ago before it got cold. So, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, an overall cool guy. So we're really, really happy to have you join us tonight, Todd. I'll let you take it from there. Thanks so much, Don. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I have a, a seven-year-old boy, so he's just getting into the age of wanting to attempt to break bones. So, of course, I have to break a few along with him. So <laughs> it's a good time. It's a good time. I took a couple of good spills. Um, uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, again, a real pleasure to be here and talk to you guys about the river that I love. Um, uh, yeah, a little bit more about myself. Uh, I was sort of a lifelong angler that got distanced from it a little bit. Uh, when I went off to college, um, but I was not a fly fisherman, uh, but I, I lived in the city when 9-11 happened and I didn't last a year. I needed to get out. I moved up to the mountains in the lower Hudson Valley and literally within a week of moving back to the mountains, I started fishing again and all the addictions of my younger years came right back. And um, after bouncing around a bit in the Hudson Valley, I landed in the Catskills uh, about 14 years ago. And um, I had visited Esopus Creek once while living in the Southern Hudson Valley because of my fishing buddy had somehow discovered online. Now, and you have to put in perspective, this is like 20 years ago. So a little harder to find information on, on the web 20 years ago, but he had un uncovered the fact that, that the Esopus had this wild rainbow trout population. So we actually came up, me and him and another buddy of mine, we came up the day before April 1st, day before opening day, for whatever reason, to scope out the Esopus. And we found this, you know, beautiful river. We drove around and had lunch and talked to people and the whole thing and basically just river gazed because it wasn't yet open. And then it wasn't until I think maybe about eight years later that I actually wound up moving up here and this becoming the river that I love. And I started to fish and uh, closed on my house in the middle of winter uh, and started learning how to cast in a field um, before I'd even ever had a chance to fly fish. And uh, so that's what sort of began my love of fly fishing. It was my whole experience with fly fishing has essentially been on the Esopus and fishing this river and seeing it through now six absolutely devastating storms and floods uh, where my, you know, downtown Phoenicia has flooded. Uh, People have, you know, lost homes, had, you know, lives and families uprooted by storms. Um, and of course, we'll wind up talking a little bit about the one that we just had on Christmas because it was half the size of Irene. Um, so a lot of the sort of watershed management issues that we were just finally fully recovering from uh, have sort of reared their head a little bit. It's not going to be as bad as Irene, uh, but it's interesting and it, it's sort of a good segue into talking about um, 
about this river and, and kind of what really makes it, you know, um, the amazing place that it is in the Catskills and what differentiates the Eastern Catskills from the Western Catskills. So I think I'll back up a little bit and just, and not to go back to the sort of Theodore Gordon part of history here in the Catskills, but if you don't know, um, the, 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 the rivers here, what they're really uh, known for is the evolution of the sport, primarily in terms of gear and fly tying. Um, you know, obviously the sport came from Europe, but the, the evolutions that happened here specifically are what made fly fishing what it is today globally. Um, everything from patterns to, um, you know, uh, the, the, first, the first issue of Fly Fisherman magazine, which was laid out on the banks of the Esopus at a small lodge called the Rainbow Lodge. Uh, the first hatch charts done by Art Flick were actually started on the Esopus and finished um, on the Skahari. Uh, you have America's first fishing resort uh, located uh, in downtown Phoenicia. You have uh, um, unsubstantiated, but apparently some of the Payne's tapers uh, were test driven here that are still used today in bamboo rod making. Um, obviously the first locally relevant dry flies, uh, the classic Catskill dry fly style of tying all of these things, um, that were started here on these rivers. Um, the really famous part though, that Don mentioned before, obviously sort of the Delaware system, uh, in those areas, um, the, what's interesting about the, the Delaware is that, uh, historically it was not a trout fishing stream at all. Um, if you read books before the 60s, um, you'll find that uh, references to the Delaware refer to it as one of the premier bass fisheries because it was a warm water fishery. So um, the, uh, the reservoir system here in the Catskills, if you don't realize, is all the rivers pretty much of the Catskills are impounded for uh, New York City drinking water. Uh, the, in almost every case, except for the Skahari, the creation of the dams became uh, the very thing which has now in the face of global warming and natural occurrences sort of saved the fisheries of the Catskills. Um, in, a in their natural state, uh, pretty much every, almost every fishery, except for the ones in the Eastern Catskills where we are, uh, would be uh, warm, cool enough for trout, but primarily would be the sort of typical put and take trout fisheries that um, have become more and more the norm uh, nationally with, with, with water temperatures going up. They simply don't have the elevations in the headwaters to carry cold water all the way down to the areas where we tend to fish. Um, so it's the, actually the creation, the cold water releases that come from the dam system that's been implemented here that uh, has really kept it uh, this incredible, incredible fishery uh, across all of the rivers of what are affectionately referred to as the charmed circle of uh, the Catskills, um, which is an old uh, 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 fishing article um, that's referred to uh, often from the 60s. Anyhow, so the, uh, the system that's over here um, on the Eastern Catskills, what's referred to as the High Peaks region. I think I might have said that before. You have this, is, is all glacial deposits here, right? So uh, on top of the uh, sort of pseudo tailwater that we have, we don't have a dam at the top. We have a portal that imparts it sort of halfway down the river. Um, in addition to this incredible influx of cold water that we get here, which sustains our wild rainbows, um, we also have these, um, wonderful mountains that are technically not mountains at all. They're really a, um, they're really glacial deposits. They're piles of glacial till. Um, they're not tectonic or volcanic upheaval, which is what we normally affiliate, uh, is the, the, the textbook definition of what a mountain actually is. Um, and we have all these great consequences of the fact that these are essentially piles of stone instead of uh, pushed up uh, volcanic, um, movement of, of, of bedrock, uh, the piles of stone do two things. They create, for one, an extremely rapid rate of descent in the mountains that we have here. So rather than slow meandering uh, waters from peak to valley, we have a very fast, rapid uh, rate of, of decline, um, which means that we have lots of plunge pools in our headwaters and an enormous amount of oxygen that gets imparted um, in that rapid rate of descent. 
Um, the glacial till also creates just a natural filter for the waters um, that come through here. There's a local joke, two stones for every dirt, <laughs> which uh, I even love the, the sort of grammatical error in that. Um, there are uh, anywhere that you dig, everything is dirt. If you need to put a fence up in the Catskills, uh, it should take a day. It's going to take two weeks because every hole is going to take you two hours. Everywhere you dig, every rock is a river stone and it's just pervasive. Um, there are, uh, so you just get this natural filter. It's one of the reasons that New York City identified the waters of the Catskills is because they knew that they we're going to be getting this unbelievably clean water that ultimately still to this day is not um, does not go through any filtration. It's the world's largest all natural water supply. Um, they do add some uh, alum to it because of the turbidity that we have here. Um, and uh, what have it, alum actually attaches itself to the to the um, the clay particles that we have here in the Catskills, and then just drops them to the bottom of a reservoir um, that's down in, in Westchester, just above Manhattan. Um, so, uh, and then obviously we've got these just wonderful cold water um, uh, seeps and aquifers and 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 everything. Uh, we have there are little valleys here in, in in my area, the Catskills, where you can still find ice and snow uh, into June. Um, you know that's how cold. Uh, some of these valleys are. Um, if, uh, as conservationists, if you've heard about the Blue Hole, which was sort of like a public area that got overwhelmed by tourists in the last couple of years, got a lot of natural attention. Um, people think that the name of that place refers to the color of the water and Catskills water tends to be sort of blue, green, turquoise uh, in its clearest state. Um, but the name actually comes from the color of your lips when you leave, um, because the headwaters <laughs> of the Rombat are some of the the coldest waters that are in the Catskills. And like I said, I've seen ice down there in June, um, right where uh, we have this sort of like amazing uh, uh, brook trout fishery in the, in the upper, upper part of the Rhondda. So um, the, uh, and what I was talking before, if some of you hadn't made it, I had the honor of sort of getting invited up to the very private property um, called Winnesook, which is the headwaters of the Asokas. And I got to visit that uh, about a year ago, almost to the day within about a week and a half. And uh, what's interesting about um, the, the headwaters there is that uh, the, the hilltop, top of Slide Mountain, um, what I refer to as, as the worm crawls, because it's not really as the crow flies, but you're, you're literally like the top of one side of the little ridge is the headwaters of the West branch of the Never Sink and the other side of the ridge is the headwaters of the Ahsoka. So uh, as the worm crawls, it's about probably, it's less than a hundred feet, um, but it takes you same thing. It takes you a while to walk around or over or what have you, um, but you have a completely different geological makeup and different pH ultimately that dramatically uh, changes pH on, on either side of, of that ridge. Um, and it's all about just the way that the glacial till kind of poured out. Um, and what it does for us is it gives us near ideal pH conditions um, for trout uh, and the headwaters up there at Slide are one of the most rain rich environments in the entire state of New York. Um, so you've got this really cold, really wet, uh, slow releasing headwaters. By slow releasing, I mean a uh, just sort of uh, slang. I don't, I don't even know if there's a scientific term that, you know, some rivers will just spit all our water out very, very quickly. Uh, they don't have deep uh, aquifers. And so like in a rainstorm and post rainstorm, you know, that water will be gone uh, very, very quickly. One of the things that's fantastic about the Asopus is that water really clings up top and it's just imparted slowly. Um, so uh, it's just sort of a, even, uh, even when it's the middle of summer, you're still going to find cold water way up in the headwaters. And assuming that uh, we don't have flood state, uh, sort of like a, a flood situation down in, sorry, uh, a drought situation down in the New York reservoirs, and we're able to hold on to the water that's in our reservoir, um, we get cool water coming out of our portal all through the summer. The uh, reservoir that feeds our river, the Schoharie, uh, relative to the other uh, reservoirs uh, in the Catskills is very small. So the Cannonsville, which feeds the West Branch of the Delaware, uh, enormous. Uh, the Papactin Reservoir, which feeds the East Branch of the Delaware, enormous. That water 
the cold water is never exhausted in those watersheds. And that's why those, those watersheds are so fantastic. Um, in fact, I, the, the East branch um, of the Delaware, I believe is one of only about six rivers in the state that received the um, premier wild fishery designation in the new, in the new regulations. Um, we actually, it's the opposite problem on the East branch. You usually have to drive downstream to find water warm enough to fish. That's how cold the water can be, even in the middle of summer, um, coming out of the, coming out of the, uh, um, the Papacton, uh, up in Downsville. And honestly, we have the same, we have a similar problem here on the Esopus. The Esopus is usually pretty slow to start. So, uh, you know, people that, that are just, you know, chopping at the bit for that first Hendrickson hatch of the season. Um, year after year after year, those hatches come off and nothing surfaces, nothing comes up to eat the first hatches that happen on the Esopus. It's still cold and the fish are still kind of in their, uh, you know, their pseudo hibernation and, and, and it takes them a little while to move. You gotta go, uh, from a fishing perspective, you gotta go deep beginning of the season um, until, until stuff really turns on. Uh, as a guide, I don't take first timers out until uh, May 15th, actually. It's just a, a little rule that I have because it's that, it can be that difficult to, to have some successful outings, um, especially for first timers. But, uh, but all these things sort of come together and make this unbelievable environment here for, for wild trout. As Don mentioned, um, what we call silver bullets here on the Esopus, the wild rainbow trout population that we have here is, uh, is really, really fantastic. Um, uh, we do have the Esopus also terminates into the Ashokan Reservoir. So you have these typical environments where trout can get large, move down to the reservoir, get even bigger because they have better food supply down there, and then come back up into the Esopus and spawn. Uh, the way that they were meant to. Um, and uh, with that, with those conditions of constant cold water and then a, like a big playground for them to get nice and big uh, before they start spawning, we are able to sustain uh, an exclusively wild rainbow trout population, a very healthy brown population and uh, brook trout populations in most of the tribs and especially the headwaters of the river um, I don't talk about that too much on social media. Uh, and then uh, we have actually begun doing some, uh, sorry, we being uh, my Trout Unlimited chapter, uh, Shokan Papakton chapter, uh, we have been doing some uh, heritage strain brook trout studies in our tributaries and have uh, continued to find uh, success uh, in identifying actual heritage strain native um, uh, brook trout. Uh, but what, what happens, what's interesting about any place that's been lived in and fished for a while is that every tributary has a story. Every little population of non-migratory fish has a reason for being there. <laughs> in many cases, there's tons of impassable falls on our, on our tributaries. And, uh, you know, time and time again, you wind up after years of fishing a place that you think is just completely... Uh, crafted by the hands of nature. And one place in particular I can think of uh, that it turns out that as a, as a, uh, as a young boy, some, some old timer that's now in his eighties used to carry Browns up from the river uh, in a bucket <laughs> and has created an unbelievable non-migratory trout population up in the headwaters of one of the tributaries here. Um, and you'll just, you'll get stories like that. So it's an interesting, it's interesting mix. Um, <clears throat> of, of, it's become an interesting mix of, of, of stocked and wild trout here in the Esopus. But one of the reasons uh, that, you know, Don invited me in is to talk to you about uh, what happened here as far as protecting the wild trout populations of the Esopus, uh, in that we were actually able to get the DC to overturn uh, the designation here. For, for, for trout, uh, we were slated to be the most heavily stocked river in the entire state by the numbers. And those numbers were going to increase from 2020 to 2021 uh, on a fold of seven, about 7,000 trout increase. It was gonna go from, <clears throat> it was gonna be from 17 or 18, 
sorry, 16, sorry, 17,000, sorry, 17,000 up to 24,000, uh, increase of 7,000 trout uh, that they were going to, to add um, to, the, to the brown stocking uh, here on the Esopus, <clears throat> which had us generally rather disappointed, obviously. And, uh, but we had been talking for, for uh, you know, years and years to uh, DP and DC um, after the, the, uh, the Creel studies that had been done here, <clears throat> that we were just seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, just seeing enormous numbers of, of rainbow trout uh, here on the Esopus. And I think through a combination of just sheer persistence on behalf of the Trout Unlimited chapter here, and then um, uh, a PR campaign that I launched called simply, you know, the Esopus is Wild, that I launched on social media, which encouraged people to post and go back in time and, and re-tag uh, photos that they had taken with this, with this hashtag um, that, uh, that we actually got them to take another look at the river in between the initial draft uh, of the new regulations and the one that came out uh, the beginning of this past, of this winter, uh, which went from one end of the spectrum to the other. Um, I had actually sent, and I don't know if you guys got it, but I'll speak to it. I could, I could probably put it up um, on the screen. Now, ironically, when these reg new regulations came out <clears throat> in December, uh, I had started working on, um, I started working on a, a chart that really looked at just sort of in very simple terms, like what does it take for, uh, what does it take for a, a, a fish population to rebound? Thanks for pulling that up, Tom. And, and you can kind of get a, a, get a sort of a quick look at this. Um, and the chart starts at, at 2011. That's, what, that's when Irene hit here, at, well, sorry, hit everywhere, but obviously destroyed our river. And um, it was also the start of the Creel surveys. And I don't know, uh, I forget off the top of my head what the nearest river to you guys was, which uh, was used um, by the DEC to update um, uh, the, 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 the trout stocking algorithms for lack of a better word. Right? So if you don't know um, what really happened, what really informed the new stocking regulation statewide was a study of eight rivers. Um, and in one case, it was a river and its tributary. I'm not, I can't remember why or what have you, but um, so eight watersheds that were used as benchmarks for the entire state, uh, the state's reassessment for, for stocking regulations. Um, and the first year of those Creel studies was 2011 when Irene hit. So starting these Creel surveys with essentially loss of what I call the first three year class, um, which you'll see all the way in that first column, all the way to the left, the year of the young, the fry and the egg. Um, those three at least were essentially would have been completely wiped out by what we had was a peak flow of 80,000 cubic feet per second measured here on the surface during Irene. Um, that's about the amount of water that's going over Niagara Falls, I believe, <laughs> um, that was, that, that we had here. Um, so for the, for the three years following Irene, uh, you have a, unbelievably compromised population of rainbow trout here on the Esopus. And um, by my estimates, it's actually something that immediately gets worse, not better um, in the first couple of years, because as you, if you start to do the, and, and see what happens as you progress from left to right across this chart, as you move towards say 2014, you literally have, um, you've got eggs in year of the young, and you have technically six-year-old trout, but you have nothing in the reproductive age class for rainbow trout, which is generally three to five years. Um, so you actually have years then after the initial hit of the storm where you have no trout that are reproducing. And it's really, um, or in this case, no rainbow trout that are reproducing. So that's the data that they had when crafting the regulations and when you sort of look at it in this way and say, oh, right, of course, you would have seen data that would have indicated a terrible, two things. One, 
that we need to put a ton of trout in if we want to achieve angler satisfaction. The DEC uh, used to define angler satisfaction simply as one trout per hour. And so they had an algorithm that would determine from river to river, how many do we have to put in so that any person, regardless of skill set, is going to interact with one trout every hour for of fishing. That was, that was what the definition was. So obviously, if, if data coming off of this is what was informing that, it would have said, yeah, you know, we need to put a lot more fish into the river to, to achieve angler satisfaction. Um, Secondly, you would have seen a massive, massive decline of rainbow trout in your population, which is exactly what all the scientists said that they were seeing. Um, and in fact, uh, and, I, and I always bring this story up respectfully because the scientists involved are all people who I love, who are huge advocates for this river, but a ma pretty major study that got a, a fair amount of press uh, was funded because the data was showing this collapse of rainbow trout. And a lot of the, you know, my, my fellow board members in Trout Unlimited, you know, started really freaking out. And I said, guys, I understand. And this is before I started looking at it in this way. We're going, again, we're going back to, you know, somewhere in the realm of 2013 to 2015. Um, I said, guys, we're catching lots of little rainbows, right? And yeah. I was like, okay, so you know that they're in the river, right? Yes. Okay. So I'm not anti-science, but maybe the data is wrong, right? Because what we're observing is not what they are telling us. We just need some more time for these uh, small trout to, to make their way and just rebound from what happened in the storm. So sure enough, the, uh, the, the collapse of the rainbow trout population was incorrect. By the time the study was done, uh, the hypothesis was not only wrong, but the complete opposite of what they had set out to prove in the study in that the rainbow trout population was actually stronger than they had anticipated. And of course, um, rebounding uh, uh, very, very, very well. Uh, the one thing in particular though, in, in, in that study, which comes and informs part of what I've done here on this chart, um, and, and, and actually which, what leads me to say that this chart I think is, is actually very conservative, um, especially in, uh, sort of the, the years from 2011 to 2020, where you're see, still seeing uh, the red and orange uh, horizontal bars uh, present in the river, is that um, almost there are very few rainbow trout in the Esopus that are older than two years old. And that's something that, that, that I look at as seeing pretty hard data um, that came out of, of, of that report that was done, that was looking at the, the history of rainbow trout here. And, and, and um, had, they had actually posited that it was all gonna be uh, um, connected to um, uh, changes in, in bait fish populations that were happening in the reservoir that were impacting the ability of trout to get larger, the presence of invasive uh, fish that had appeared in the reservoir, including uh, white perch, which is technically a bass, if you know about that fish, but they eat voraciously and they will out eat and out compete um, browns and rainbows when they're younger, uh, as well as predate on them. Uh, so they were expecting all these, these things. But this one thing came up out of that study, which was that there are very few rainbow trout in the river that are older than two years old. And that continues to be the case here. Uh, is that you just, you, you don't get a lot of large rainbows in our, in our river. Uh, another local joke is that all the rainbows move out of the system as soon as they hit 19 inches, 19 and three quarter inches. Uh, that a true 20 inch rainbow trout in the Esopus is like the unicorn. Um, in all my years, I've only done it twice. Uh, but it's really true. They tape out at, at 19.75 constantly. Um, but the reason for that is, and this is, you know, this is something that's somewhat conjecture, but it's something that I believe to really be true, which is that, um, and, and as you guys sort of know, the, the Trout Unlimited does not support the stocking of any fish whatsoever over wild trout populations, period. Um, which means that I live in a watershed that until this year, is in direct conflict with um, direct conflict with the, the the very thing that we're trying to do as Trout Unlimited. Um, uh, I'll mention one thing before because we can probably take this down now. You guys kind of get this idea and start to look. I'll point out one thing 
though, is, is if you look at 2021 and you look at the little note that's up top there, um, 2021 was to be our first year with six generations of only semi-compromised rainbow trout uh, in, in, in the river. Uh, we've been seeing the rainbow trout population rebound and unbelievably in the last three years, especially, which has been incredible. And if you look at 2020 and the preceding years, you'll see that that um, way up at the top, the very first row, you'll see that after years of, of pretty much 20,000 trout that they even last year, they dropped that number by 3000 in the stocked, uh, stocked trout. And, and, and we all could see that even that slight dip made a positive impact on the number of rainbows that were staying, uh, that were present in the system. But so 2021 was to be, uh, by my estimation, the first year of, of only slightly comp compromised population. And then if you fast forward all the way to the end there, 2028 um, would have been, uh, by, by my estimation, truly back to a truly natural state of just how strong the population could be um, because uh, you've got all six year classes, all seven year classes, um, the way I've sort of done it here, uh, being um, sort of as good as they could possibly get. Um, but of course we got another storm. So um, you can essentially, with the level of what we got could pretty much transpose all those red lines all the way to the right now over to 2021 because especially for, you know, for the time of year that that hit again, a, a bit later than, a bit later than uh, when Irene hit, Irene hit in August. Uh, it just means that really you're wiping out not only the rainbow trout, but all of those eggs and fry of the spawning browns that had just happened in the fall. So all of those browns that would have been like your first strain of wild browns moving their way through now that we're not gonna get any stocking, um, uh, all that gets reset, uh, sort of again. Uh, but I'm always, you know, I'm always really, really, you know, I digress. There, there was one point that I wanted to make just a minute ago. Um, I really feel that the, the biggest problem with putting stock trout into any river is quite simply that what I call it, it's gang warfare. Um, they erode the genetic predisposition for the pecking order in a river. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. Um, wild trout that need to compete for food with just a stubborn, stupid stocks trout that doesn't respect that pecking order um, is just going to leave when they have the opportunity. And that's one of the almost sort of the, the, the negatives of the, of the uh, reservoir is that ultimately they do find their way down to that reservoir and then they get happy. And I think that that's just a big part of what's happening here is when you, when you throw, you know, thousands and thousands of stocked fish on top of wild fish, those fish are just, the, the wild fish are just going to leave if they can. And, um, and that's, I think, the biggest reason for, for not stocking over wild populations. Um, and I just, we're just really so excited uh, to have the opportunity to see what's going to happen without stocking here. We've gotten nothing short of absolute threats by the, uh, by the Hills Brother coffee can contingency uh, here in our area um, that we, you know, they will come out guns a blazing. Um, I mean that figuratively, not literally um, to, 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 to squash any catch and release on our river. And I do believe that that would be the case. And I don't believe that catch and release is really the, the issue at hand here anyway, but uh, I think on behalf of the DC, on DC's behalf, we're very ups worried about upsetting that contingency, that voice um, in, in our area. Uh, and uh, you know, what we have now by just eliminating stocking, I think is something that nobody ever saw coming. And, and I'll be honest, when I started the campaign, the, um, the, uh, the, about the Esopus being a wild trout fishery, it was simply this, was that when, because I knew that the, that the, the state was finally gonna be putting some energy into essentially marketing rivers, right? The, one of the, the biggest surprises that came out of the, all those creel surveys and all the stuff that came in the public input um, meetings was, uh, and they told us straight up was, that they just couldn't believe how interested people were in finding wild trout. It was like the number two most important thing to people uh, besides 
essentially catch rate or what they had deemed as angler satisfaction. So uh, being able to find wild trout was the second most important thing to anglers statewide. And, and I realized once we saw basically the way that they had structured the wild trout designations for the, the handful of rivers that were going to get that was that they were going to market that now in material statewide and say, look, if you want to hunt wild trout, these are the places to go. Um, so it upset, you know, it upset a lot of people in uh, ideologically, I think, that we didn't get a wild trout population. I'll also be honest, I wasn't overly upset with the management practices that had been uh, attributed to this initial stocking um, designation that we got. And I just never expected them to flip. So from my perspective, uh, the whole initiative of, you know, the Esopus is Wild was simply to do the same thing, to create a piece of marketing that was pervasive, uh, that kept people aware of the fact that the Esopus was a really great wild trout fishery. And that we already knew that it didn't matter how many brown trout they were gonna put in here, the wild trout were gonna continue to thrive and survive. And we'd seen it again, because we were finally getting into all these years post Irene, we're like, wow, so here we are, you know, just about 10 years later, and these rainbows are finally rebounding in this unbelievable way. Uh, and that's what it started, sort of gave me the impetus to do that chart. Um, it's like, why did it take this long? What, how, you know, how would it have really played out? Um, but uh, so we were just really excited about it. Um, and uh, what we jokingly started to talk about a couple of years ago, and then people literally did start talking about was that we should just start um you know eating more stocked brown trout and that we should actually start encouraging catch and keep um i personally as a guide um and and as an advocate for um for, for actually maybe not advocate i'll say as, as having the holding the responsibility of teaching uh in my case predominantly first timers um, how to fly fish is to sort of remove um, what I call the moral stigma from the choice of catch and keep and catch and release. Um, and it is part of why I named my company Creel, because I think that it, it, it you know, I didn't want to shy away from this conversation. Um, I think I can respectfully say to this audience that, um, uh, you know, as, um, as conservationists, we're often uh, and as people who work in the realm of nonprofitism in general, um, the, the role the role of, of activists is to advocate for the extreme. Uh, the role of politicians is to advocate for compromise. That's the difference. As conservationists, um, we have constantly um, used the guise of pure catch and release fishing uh, often. Uh, and I'm not speaking for everybody, but we all know that there are plenty of people in our world who uh, espouse 100% catch and release. And then every once in a while, they'll keep a trout. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and my experience with teaching, you know, mostly 25 to 35 year olds um, how to fly fish for the first time is that they, uh, they're they able to embody contradiction without developing this massive neuroses that I have to either be 100% this or 100% that. And that's actually, to me, what I find to be really um, a promising component of our younger generations. And it's just that it's, 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 it's not just the ability to embrace uh, something that seems contradictory, which people of our generation tend to be like, ah, it just makes you wishy-washy, right? Just like have some conviction. But no, it's actually, it actually makes them very complex uh, beings. And it also uh, is what I, it's what I call the antidote to the polarized nature of what's happened in our country, right? If we have, uh, thanks Richard, um, you know, if we have people who are able to, or have the desire to learn about catch and release, learn how to identify stock versus wild trout, learn that it's bad to harvest wild trout and it's okay to harvest stocked trout because you know what, their grandfather or their, gra or their father did it, or because you know what, these are, in my case, these are all people stuck in the city and you know what, if they define authentic experience as doing something that their forefathers did, their family did, or they have a memory as a kid of like cooking a trout, it's really not a moral decision, right? I'm trying to take the morality out of that, that choice. Um, I maintain catch and release, strict catch and release. Um, I've kept one trout because uh, 
my son wanted the experience of catching and killing and doing that. And I made him do the whole thing. And I told him that it was special. And I told him it's something we weren't going to do a lot, but that if he was interested and he asked that I would do it, but I made him touch the guts. I made him do everything and he hasn't asked me to do it again. So, um, uh, but that's sort of what I do. It's, and it's, it's something that I, 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 I make a part of every single one of my, uh, of my lessons on the Esopus. Luckily, we have an extremely fish, so we'll get back to the fish, and it's like a very fish dense population here, um, which means that literally every single person that I take out on the water pretty much catches a fish. It's, it's really, it's, it's great. We have that, um, we have that benefit. Um, with that high fish density comes though, as I was saying before, competition for food and a smaller average fish size. So the Esopus is not a big trout river. Uh, historically. Um, but that said, it's exactly what we're going to start to get um, in now that the, the stocking is going to stop. Um, and so here's, here's some of the, some of the things that I've learned, some of the secrets uh, of what happens after a massive storm, like what we had with Irene or what we had, had this Christmas storm. Um, the Christmas storm was half the size, almost almost on the, on, uh, on the nose is half the, half the CFS of, um, of Irene. Uh, so we had 40,000 CFS, um, in this Christmas storm. Uh, I, the last I checked, we're still getting, uh, turbidity NTUs in the fifties, which is just an astronomical amount of turbidity. Um, the, uh, local DEP office is still evaluating, uh, impact, um, I'm still driving around. I, just, I haven't been able to drive every tributary and drive up to the Schoharie because whatever's um, the, you know, everything that's feeding the reservoir still has to make its way through the Esopus, um, through our portal. Um, what is typical CFS for this time? Um, typical, well, this year, you know, you, it, it's, it's really just average average flows that they need to, to send water through our systems, whatever they need to do to get water through us and down to the city to keep the reservoir, the downstate reservoirs full, right? So the, I forget what the total across the entire capsules what the system holds, but the, the downstate system only holds a repository of about a hundred, now I'm forgetting, it's either a hundred or 200 days of water. Uh, New York City consumes just over a billion gallons a day and the downstate system holds, I think it's 200 billion, if I'm remembering, right? So in any given moment, even though it's like, oh, 200 days, right? If it never rained again, you've got 200 days. And so the DEP, that's not a lot of days for the city, right? The city would implode without water. So their, their role, first and foremost, is essentially to keep all the downstate uh, reservoirs as full as possible, uh, allowing for, uh, you know, flooding. Uh, and not getting too close. So the average flow for right now, because you're, everything's frozen and you're not getting any runoff is actually relatively low. Uh, but then pretty quickly in the beginning of the season, you'll get, um, they'll start moving more and more down state um, to really make sure that they're filling up and capturing as much of the runoff, right? Because it's a, you know, while it's an essentially exhaustible resource, there's also the limits of what the reservoirs can hold. So even if you have a surplus of water, it doesn't mean you're high on the hog if you have nowhere to put it. So we have release channels and stuff like that, which cause all these other problems we're not gonna get into. However, another secondary issue post storm is how do you get rid of all this turbid water, right? Is you have to push some water through the lower surface and people on the lower surface get um, a little bit bent out of shape of that. But, um, you know, so we have loss after a storm like this, you have loss of the surplus. You just, you can't, you have nowhere to put it. So you gotta get rid of it. Um, so it's, it's only just enough. So uh, right now flows are, are extremely low. It's hard to tell though for us because actually we had numerous, um, our gauges got wiped out in the storm and they haven't come back online yet. So, um, so there's that. Um, I will mention though that the Asopus has several uh, USGS gauges. Um, on my, like on my website, we aggregate all of those. Um, but if you're coming down to fish, our, and I keep saying it, but we'll get back to, I guess we have plenty of time. We'll get back to the fishing part. Um, is uh, One of the things for sure, if you're planning a trip on coming down to the Esopus, is to look at the gauges and look at turbidity. 
um, because uh, it can it can it can make your day bad um, if it's too turbid. I generally tell people that um, because NTU's is such a weird number anyway, but in our system six six and below. Um, six NTUs and below generally means that the entire river is, is relatively fishable. Um, uh, anything sort of 10 and below, uh, if you, as you get to know the river really well, um, you can figure out if you get here, um, okay, can I, can I, and it's not basically the middle of summer either when it's at absolute warmest, you can figure out where that turbidity is coming from. Is it coming from the portal uh, or is it coming from uh, one of the tributaries, uh, and then try and get above uh, where the turbidity is coming from. So I'd say that you can usually find, especially in the shoulder seasons, um, you can find fishable water up to 10 uh, as you start to get more familiar with the system. Um, I don't know the degree because uh, I, I don't fish up by you guys as much, um, but the tributaries here play a big part uh, in your angling success as well. Um, and again, especially in the shoulder seasons, um, the tributaries here have been hit very hard by successive high water events. And because of back to that two, two stones for every dirt thing that I mentioned earlier, um, you have a lot of material that's been moved around in our tributaries um, that is not doesn't necessarily properly convene into the main stem and pushed downstream. So a lot of our tributaries have unfortunately flattened out, uh, become shallow and become very susceptible to ambient temp warming uh, from the sun. So when you're in your shoulder seasons, uh, the, the tributaries are, the more you learn the tributaries, and this goes for really any fishery, but especially if you're in a turbid fishery, if the tributaries are running clear, you know, aim for spots on the main stem of that of the of, of your watershed uh, that are just below clear flowing tributaries. Um, so when we're getting a lot of mud that's exclusively coming out of the portal, you aim for a trib, and sometimes that can be just enough to be imparting clear water that's going to get um, rainbow trout moving more. Rainbow trout are site feeders in ways that uh, brown trout are not. Um, so the turbidity compromises the ability for especially wild rainbow trout. Uh, not hatchery trout um, that that exist here. The wild rainbows, um, you know, they have a harder time eating when the uh, um, when the water is is really muddy. Um, so you'll you'll sometimes see uh, better uh, rainbow trout uh, opportunities just below those tributaries. Um, similarly, the those ambient temps I was just talking about uh, at the very end of the year, the very beginning of the year. Uh, peak sun around, you know, uh, one or two o'clock means that those tributaries are going to warm up a little bit more than uh, the esopus and then be imparting slightly warmer water that might be just enough to trigger hatches um, just below uh, a tributary in the main part of the esopus. Um, I'll, I'll tell one of the spots I'm always happy to share because a lot of people shy away from it is, is downtown Phoenicia on the esopus. Um, the stony clove comes in right there. You have great pocket water. Um, there's not a lot of uh, um, uh, spots to access there, and it's very exposed, um, but the views are absolutely beautiful. Um, and uh, there's a, a little stretch that's only about, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe 100 yards uh, between a bridge and the Stony Clove. It's just a fantastic little pocket water stretch that holds huge fish. And um, it's one of the places that I will go on. I, I don't really have to cross the, you know, I'm not as inclined to do the, the bucket list, you know, opening day, closing day trout. I've done it enough times, but I'll tell you every time I've done it, it's been in the main stem. Um, it's always been just below Stony Clove. Uh, it's just a, it's a trip that's able to water, to warm up a little bit more and you'll find active trout there uh, on, um, on really cold days. Um, so the tributaries from, a, from an angling and upping your angling game around here, I think, play, play a really, really big part. Um, and, and certainly as, uh, as fellow members of TU, I will, and something I also don't generally do on social media is uh, the, the tributaries on the Esopus are stunning. Um, the, uh, explore them, enjoy them, 
you'll find, uh, you know, you do some, do some Googling or, or come into the shop and, 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 you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you some info that the tributaries here just are really beautiful uh, and really amazing uh, spots to fish. Um, and uh, especially um, the Stony Club is really nice. There's a lot of access on the Stony Club. You just drive along the river. Um, Woodland Creek is another spot that's, it's, it's quite nice. Um, and uh, yeah, actually affords uh, like Woodland, Woodland Creek is a tributary that has a contingency of landowners that allows, it is not public access uh, fishing, uh, but you'll see a special sign that says uh, fly fishing only access. Um, and it's literally just, hey, it's my land. And I've decided to put up a sign that says, if you're fly fishing, you can fish my backyard, but you can't do it. You can't do it with, with uh, spin gear. Um, so, you know, it's a very, uh, friendly environment here. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the history of this river, again, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Esopus was uh, it's basically the corner of the Stony Clove, which I mentioned earlier, just a, a minute ago, the Stony Clove and the, and the Esopus, uh, 90 acres on the, that corner where the, those two rivers meet, the confluence there was uh, Milo Barber's uh, fishing resort, America's first uh, fishing resort. Um, what's interesting about uh, Milo Barber's and when it launched and um, the exact dates are, I'm, I'm forgetting at this point, but, um, you know, one of the reasons that the Catskills became a very famous fly fishing destination, apart from being great fly fishing close to New York, was the Hudson uh, River School of Painters. So a little, back to a little bit of history lesson, uh, the Hudson River School of Painters, championed by Thomas Cole, uh, is a name that a lot of people know, uh, ironically, Thomas Cole was one of the only one uh, painters of that crew that was not an angler. Um, and all those guys that did the, 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 those famous uh, Hudson Valley uh, paintings were actually or emulating a sort of a, a, the right to wander uh, laws that existed in England, right? And exist to this day. <clears throat> if you don't know, you can walk around England um, you can't fish the rivers anymore, but now it's strictly hiking, but you can, you can essentially trespass as long as you're not sticking around. Um, and that's basically what a lot of those, those painters were doing. In fact, they invented, um, uh, they invented glasses that were basically colored, colored lenses in the glasses that would al allow them in the middle of the day to mimic the light that you would see at dawn and dusk. So everybody wanted dawn and dusk paintings, but these guys wanted to fish the hatch. So they actually developed glasses that allowed them to look at the, 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 the land and look at the rivers and look at the mountains and sort of uh, mimic what they would look like more at dawn and dusk by wearing glasses. And that's when they painted, they painted in between in the middle of the day in a lot of cases. Um, but those, those paint, and, and if you know your history uh, a little bit, you know that, well, that essentially, um, uh, yeah, exactly, rose colored glasses. Um, the, the, the history of, outdoor recreation was basically fueled by these paintings being exhibited uh, down in Manhattan. Uh, people saw the paintings and when they found out that uh, people had an, uh, you know, real short version that, oh, you killed all the, all the Native Americans in the Catskills and we can go there and stay there. Oh, oh that's great. Okay, let's go. And so um, that was really what gave birth to outdoor recreation because outdoors before we started exterminating Native Americans, was a scary thing to do because you could you could get killed out there, uh, uh, and um, the the those paintings became the advertisement for the Catskills, and for the Hudson Valley. Um, but interestingly enough, um, uh, within about a year of those paintings being exhibited, and reviewed and lauded down in the city, Milo Barber started advertising in newspapers down in the city. So there is actually overlap between the, the launch of this first fishing destination and the marketing uh, that surrounded Milo Barber's and the exhibitions of these paintings. Um, so uh, people came to the Esopus and started uh, fishing up here and fishing the Stony Clove. Uh, so that's where Milo Barber's is located. Uh, there are reports and gosh, I haven't read them in a, in a while, but there is a published report in a newspaper out of Kingston. And don't forget, right, Kingston was also back uh, for a long time, was still you know, highly political because it was the original uh, capital of, of New York. So um, that's where people were taking a train over to, up to Kingston and come over. 
Uh, but there, so the Kingston newspaper reported uh, fishing excursions on the stony clove that boasted uh, literally thousands and thousands of trout being caught in a matter of two days on a weekend. Um, uh, multiple multiple reports of catching, and those were those were all brook trout, right? So this is before this is before the federal stocking program was in place. Um, so this is all brook trout, all native, hundred percent native brook trout that they were talking about, and catching them literally by the thousands and thousands. I'd have to, I, I'm, I'm literally, I'm blanking on the on the the, the exact number right now, but it's in Ed Van Putt's book, um, uh, fishing fly fish, uh, fishing in the Catskills. Um, Fly fishing the Catskills, excuse me, and um, uh, those reports are just they're just they're just bonkers <laughs> uh, of the number of of, of uh, brook trout that were here. They were in fact per, for the most part fished out. That's that's how that's how heavily recreationally fished the Esopus was um, uh, in its early years. Uh, and then when the there's stories and the reservoir was actually created. Um, in, in, in most cases, the reservoir systems, for the reservoir systems, they would build the reservoir, valleys were flooded, and then um, it took somewhere around a year or two of uh, forcibly um, putting screens over the intake valves for all those reservoirs to remove the, the last of the debris that they weren't able to really get up when they relocated all those homes, right? So you had imminent, imminent domain that came in, they kicked people out of their homes, they cut down trees, leveled the land, but then all every branch and stuff like that that they didn't want flowing through this giant, you know, um, uh, Army Corps of Engineers project of, of the main aqueducts, right? The Catskill Aqueduct and the, and the Delaware Aqueduct that go down to downstate. Um, and the stories go that on a daily basis, they were removing two foot brook trout from those screens as they were flooding the basins. Um, so that, that's what we, we had here was essentially a, a, a never to be seen again, world-class uh, brook trout fishery. That, that's what the natural state of this place was um, before the creation of the dam system. Um, so you can imagine the sort of lingering animosity that still exists about the creation of that dam system. Um, but uh, as I said earlier, <clears throat> uh, all things given, uh, we would, and not so much the Asopa, not as much the, the Eastern part, again, because we've got the high peaks here. And that's something that the Delaware system doesn't have. It is, you know, natural, its natural state is a warm water fishery. Our natural state is a cold water fishery. And to some extent we would still always, and we all will always, there will always be trout here. There's no way to exterminate all those trout unless you had like really catastrophic global warming. Um, but uh, but it, the creation of the reservoir system has really, uh, I, uh, I hate to say it, or I love to say it, I don't know, it's saved the trout fishing in the Catskills um, from east to west in all of our rivers here. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, but, uh, but again, this turbidity um, issue because the Catskills, again, this Eastern Catskills, these uh, glacial till, Catskills um, is very clay based. And uh, so turbidity is the, is the problem that we, we sort of accept here. Um, we accept turbid water because it's cold um, and maintains uh, the quality of fishing that we have. Um, the Esopus uh, uh, getting back into uh, to, to some fishing stuff and more that I can tell you about here, we don't have uh, we don't have bug soup on the Esopus. Uh, uh, bug soup is, uh, as, as, as Don tells me, you know, many of you guys, you, you'll, you'll fish the Western Catskill. So you know what I'm talking about. There's, there's eight different insects hatching at any given moment. Every trout that's feeding is feeding on a different one of them. Uh, you can change your fly 16 times and still not find the one that that trout's going to hit. And it's true. Uh, and if you haven't fished the western part of the Catskills, it's absolutely true. <laughs> um, but it's quite the opposite. It's quite the opposite here, and um, it's also something that keeps me, as I said earlier, I think before we really started in the realm of sort of a guy that ties flies and not a true fly tire, because um, you know people on the, we're, we're a little scrappy here on these sofas because you don't have to be the entomologist that's requisite on 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 many rivers, you know, countrywide or just in general. Um, we call it a presentation river, right? Which means it doesn't matter so much what you're throwing, but you have to throw it really, really well. 
Um, this river also boasts an enormous number of predatory birds uh, in numbers that I do not see on the Western uh, rivers, uh, way, more so, way more so from a volume standpoint. So you've got very skittish fish here. Um, I, I, I can't speak to necessarily uh, what the experience is like for, for other guides necessarily, but um, uh, I, can push, I can push a client with or without experience know that they have not laid out the right uh uh the right cast and and know with near certainty the second that that fly hits the water um that it that that's the one that the client finally got right the presentation was finally right and i know that that trout is going to rise um assuming that they haven't slapped the surface right over where that trout is too many times but the the number of called shots that I'm able to pull off and look like a miracle worker on this river. It's, it's a lot, it's a lot because I just, I know the level, I know what the presentation needs to be. So, um, so that's another bit of advice. Uh, you know, the old, old joke, and again, I didn't write it, anything brown and anything peacock, that's what works on the Esopus. Um, there's a great, uh, the, a fly I've been trying to revive, um, uh, successfully, I guess, because, you know, I, I own the only fly shop. So people come and buy their flies is the Ledwing Coachman, which is a great old, uh, emerger pattern. Um, and it was something that came up, as I said, I, I was, I, I had to spend, um, a lot of months just reading and practicing my cast in the, in the field where I lived, uh, before I was able to start fly fishing as I was just read voraciously and everything I read about the Usopas kept talking about the Ledwing Coachman. Um, at the time I lived in the lower Hudson Valley, but I worked in the city. Um, so the first shop that I started uh, constantly hounding was the original Orvis shop um, uh, uh, down in the city. And I went in, and one of my favorite stories about that is I went in one day and I'm looking through and I just, you know, for whatever, the third time read about the Ledwing Coachman. And so I went in and, and I didn't see it on the shelves and I hadn't seen it in any Orvis catalogs. And so I asked one of the salespeople, I said, hey, uh, do you, do you guys have any lead wing coachman? And the young guy looked at me and his, his face all scrunched up. He never even heard of it. Uh, and he said, well, let me go ask, let me go ask Al or wh whomever was his name. And, and I'll, I just stood there. I watched this young man walk into the sort of back room, um, down a, a short hallway and, uh, and, and ask somebody. And I'll, I'll never forget, sort of like this, his, his head popped out. He goes, Usopus Creek, you're fishing the Usopus, right? Just, just, just that alone peeked his head out. And just that I had asked for that fly, he knew that I was, I was gonna be fishing the Usopus. And it's a fly that's really deadly here. And it's basically, it's all peacock with a, with a wing, you know, uh, and a little beard. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, that's one of the old, the old jokes about the Usopus, anything peacock and anything brown. Um, the, uh, um, the most effective, the two most effective flies on the Esopus are, are the pheasant tail and prince um, uh, to, as, as proof positive of, of what I just said, our most prolific hatch is Isonychia. All right, so, um, and we do get, if, if you're familiar with the isos, um, if you're lucky, it's a, it's a bug that hatches twice a year. Um, so the bicolor, the Isonychia bicolor, and again, I'm not the greatest entomologist, but the two variants on the Isonychia the bicolor, uh, and then the other one, uh, the bicolor hatches uh, twice a year, um, which means that the nymph of that insect is omnipresent. It's always present. And that's why I'll throw a pheasant tail 365 on the esophis and, and, and fish it confidently um, because the, that, that nymph is just always there. Um, and then especially when they're, when they're hatching, uh, it's amazing. And if you've never experienced the Isonychia hatch, uh, it's really incredible too. They're one of the few mayflies that um, uh, like a stonefly has uh, evolved to crawl out of the water and hatches uh, on the rocks, which is really, it's just really cool. It's a sight to see, you see, you know, huge bunches of them along the, the shoreline and it's a lot of fun. Um, after Irene, I invented a fly and, uh, um, oh, come on, it can't be that hard for me to figure out how to post my screen here because um, I've just okay. never done it. You should see a, a big green light at the bottom that says yep. screen. Oh, there it is. Yeah, of course. Okay, yep. so let me see. And if then I it should give that. you a menu of options, Todd, and you should be able to click on whatever, you know, 
whatever image you want to bring. I got one right there. There's there's it right there. Oh, share. All right. Now so there's a little shot of the new American. Um, and that's a fly that I developed uh, after Irene. And I test drove it and had a couple variations on it. Um, and uh, the story of the new American is that it's basically, uh, it's, a, it's a mashup of, uh, of the pheasant tail and uh, a fly called the nymphomaniac. Um, and you can look that up. The nymphomaniac is a, an entirely synthetic tie. Um, and it's entirely brown. And so this was sort of my answer of combining those two flies together. Um, you can see it's got uh, it's got its traditional uh, pheasant tail on the tail. Uh, the body though is replaced with uh, rubber uh, material, rubber, rubber body material. Um, uh, from there up, it's very much like a pheasant tail. You've got a peacock, um, and uh, then you've got this sort of above it. You've got this. Uh, slightly iridescent colored antron wing. And the trick here is that it's, it's tied like a flashback in that um, there's tinsel that goes over the, the peacock. Um, but the trick to this fly uh, is that that flashback is not actually visible on the fly. It's in there to just to help light reflect through in that slightly um, iridescent antron because the water was so muddy after Irene that I just needed something that really, really was gonna capture whatever light we had in the river. Um, so it's, it's uh, and then it's just got, it's got a collar of um, uh, material that I used to get from Doug Swisher. And now I forget where I get it. I just finally found a pretty decent uh, replacement, uh, but it's, there's some rubber legs in the, in, um, uh, in the, in the collar. Uh, uh, dubbing there and um, but it's it's really it, but by my estimate it's really this essentially buried tinsel that helps the light to really bounce around it's not it's not an overly complex fly um, but I'll tell you these rubber body materials if you're a tire are so unforgiving um, whatever's underneath it needs to be perfect to get like a really nice taper like you see here um, and one of the tricks that I've developed that really helps with this tie is, and what I like about um, the, the body material um, that I use, again, it was, a, it was a Doug Swisher product and I've been gradually finding good replacements for these. Um, this material, as opposed to like a tube, which has very slow or almost no memory um, in that rubber, uh, this, this very thin rubber that has 100% memory so when I'm tying the bottom of it, I'm actually pulling the material extremely tight so that it stretches out like a rubber band and gets thinner. And as I'm wrapping, I'm loosening the tension on it so that the material itself actually has a thinner diameter when I start the tie at the bottom and a thicker as I make my way up. So I'm using less material underneath to create, to force that taper um, and using that rubber material to create the taper. So it's a, it just, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, but uh, I will, I think, I think I've been pestered enough. I will, I will create a post or video of, uh, of how to tie this fly um, so that you guys can, can check it out. I, I traditionally tie the brown in um, 12 and 14. And then I also do a, an olive version of this that I'll tie in 16 and 14. That's a really nice bluing olive uh, um, match. So uh, beyond that, um, you know, really any really traditional profiled flies, uh, anything traditional Catskill style um, that's uh, just getting, you know, just getting it in the ballpark. Uh, is is going to work well. So again, my my advice to you guys when you're fishing the Asopus is to uh, <clears throat> rather than um, ra rather than think you might have the wrong fly, uh, think that you might have the wrong presentation, or uh, um, you know, like 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 all fly fishing, right? That they're going to be picky and and what have you. But um, you know, sometimes that six inch difference makes all the world here. 
uh, uh, really getting it in the right lane is going to make a, a huge difference um, on this river as well. Uh, the other uh, one of the other uh, mantras that I tend to tell people here is that as soon as the sun, as soon as the sun ducks behind the mountain, tie on a light kaha. <laughs> And it really doesn't even matter, uh, you know, anything, anything light, anything cream, uh, and go small. So, uh, because two things that I've noticed that the, the, the trout get is one of the only time that they're selective on this river tends to be near the end of the day, um, uh, but they're selective about size. Uh, uh, and at the end of the day here, once that light disappears, you're not going to see very well, um, especially. I'm like the poster child for eyes being the first thing to go, um, but uh, you need to you need to see it. Um, so uh, that's something I, I always tell people: uh, always carry size 16 light K hills, um, <clears throat> and uh, that's kind of what you want to switch to at the very end of the day. Here, uh, the 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 hatches at the it's it's we are also it's one of those rivers where the absolute best and again especially in the what i call the sweet spot of the shoulder season in the spring um uh may 15th to the end of june those six weeks uh the the best fishing is when is right at that point where you can't see um right at that very very end of the day um i can't tell you how many people leave for dinner and i just or how many times the best holes on the Esopus are always available at the best times <laughs> because everybody cuts out just, just a little bit too soon. Um, so uh, so uh, go, go for that. Um, there are large browns here. If you're a streamer person and you know how to fish streamers well, um, you're always gonna be effective uh, with meat on this river. Um, so don't, don't hesitate to go after our browns um, with streamers. Um, and, uh, and the other general rule that we have here is when they're, you know, when they're rising, throw dries. Um, but it is, it is for all these various reasons that I've, that I've mentioned, um, it, it is also still really considered a, um, a wet fly river. Um, and um, the deeper you get your fly down, uh, the more successful an angler you'll be here. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of Humphreys. Um, uh, one of my favorite moments uh, ever with him, if, if you hunt down the Orvis podcast with him and Tom Rosenbauer from, God, I'm afraid to even guess how many years it is at this point, but it's, it's on the old side. Um, but there's a moment, there's a moment in that, uh, that interview with Rosenbauer and, and Tom asks him, uh, you know, how many, how, how much split shot do you fish? And he goes, well, you know, I'll fish up to 10 split shot. And you can actually hear Rosenbauer choke. Like, uh, 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 what'd, you, what'd, you just, what'd you just say? Um, and, uh, and, and it just, it's just, this is a, a river that's like that. The difference, I tell people, the difference between a good angler, a good service angler and a great service angler is one split shot. Um, so don't be afraid, don't be afraid to put more on and, and, or, uh, you know, fish, uh, multiple weighted flies when I'm nymph fishing, I'm not exclusively a nympher, but I was for two years post Irene. I, I didn't throw a dry fly for two years on the Esopus. Um, in fact, I actually, I remember, um, just because I would get so sick of not casting like a regular you know dry fly cast that I would I would sometimes throw on a dry fly at the end of the day and literally not fish it I would just stand on a rock and and shadow cast essentially just to feel it because that's how pointless it was to throw a dry fly on the Esopus especially for the first year after Irene that's how that's how muddy and how how awful it was uh, but it really made it made me a, a really really good nymph fisherman um my my go-to rig when i'm nymphing is um two weighted nymphs size 12 or 14 with about 16 inches of tippet in between those two flies and then above uh above that i'm fishing two a b weights if you know weight designations that's a pretty big split shot so i'm fishing you know generally two size 12s and two a b weights about 10 inches above those two flies. So um, 
I fish I fish pretty heavy. I'm not a I'm just I'm not a huge fan of indicators. Um, I just like I like nymph fishing being a field game. Um, that's just a that's a personal choice, right? Dry fly fishing is is a uh, dry fly fishing is a is a visual game, <laughs> and nymph fishing is a field game. And uh, it's really good, you know, to, to put an indicator on is uh, with nymphs to uh, just seems like a, a lost opportunity to learn about fly fishing, actually, and, and learn how to really command your flies uh, when they're subsurface. Um, you want to be a, a, a good uh, subsurface angler, you know, learn, learn a few other casts, learn, learn how to do secondary roll casts, learn how to do a tuck cast. Um, learn, learn all the real tricks of how to get, uh, use your cast to effectively fish flies deeper. And you're going to be a, a better, uh, you're going to be a better angler. Um, back to something I started to say in the very beginning of this whole, uh, presentation was that, um, some of the best fishing I've encountered on the Esopus was actually immediately after Irene, because I very quickly learned how to get flies down deep. And that's something that um, even a lot of, I think a lot of six pretty successful um, anglers uh, don't really learn how to, how to do that, how to get their flies really, really deep. Um, so you need, to, you need to really up your game if you're gonna be able to, if you wanna fish uh, in, in, uh, in a place like the Esopish, which is occasionally gonna be really, really turbid. Um, so that's, and again, that's why, that's why streamers do work here. You know, you put your fly down, they have to move less. Uh, it's really, um, you know, the, 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 the less that trout needs to move, uh, the better success you're going to have as an angler. Uh, and I think that's another thing that is really just can't be stressed enough. And it's something that it's something that I find um, that I'm it, 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 it's something I find I'm constantly telling my even my clients that are um, are experienced is that one of the, the absolute fundamentals of our sport is that we're fishing straight lines. And I still constantly, it's one of the reasons I, I like to, I like to, I like to poke fun at, at, um, at your own infant. Um, uh, uh, you guys can steal this quote, feel free. Uh, I, I tell people that your own infant is an extremely effective tactic for catching trout. And so is fly fishing. Um, <laughs> uh, the, 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 one of the one of the consequences of your and what your nymphing does what's re, actually what's really the thing about your nymphing is it's, it's just maxing the it, it's pushing its gear to its absolute limits you just you have to do less to be successful and there's no two ways around that I'm sorry you just you, you just don't have to know as much about uh, trout fishing or fly fishing or angling because the gear is just doing a lot of the work. Um, and that's great. And, 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 and your nymphing is getting so many guys and gals into the game and it's fantastic. And I like to joke about it. Uh, but one of the things that your nymphing does is it reinforces, uh, nymph fishing and then hence all fishing, including when those anglers are doing dry fly fishing is fishing on an, on arcs, right? It's the fundamental difference between spin fishing and, and dry fly fishing is you're trying to fish in a straight line before that fly comes back to you and swings back to you. And something about Euro nymphing and something about nymphing in general is that people continue to fish on arcs, right? You, you cast out and it's coming back to you, right? You just the more guy, you know, guys and gals, if there's any gals in the, on the chapter or on the call, you know, everything about keeping that presentation in a straight line, that is the thing that's gonna up your game constantly, right? you're having a bad day or you know you got the right fly on or whatever it is right that and that's how i know when when that when my clients get that cast out and it's finally the right cast and that's usually it right the trout don't want to move laterally it's the fundamental of why fly fishing is so damn cool right it's because what i tell people is that what fly fishing is that all other things aren't and this is predominantly in dry fly fishing, right? We are not relying on the instinct of the fish to lash out at food, right? I think this is a very poetic component that even to very seasoned fly anglers sometimes missed, right? All fishing relies on the fact that in a trout, their nervous system is incredibly decentralized, 
right? As human beings, we understand we have 100% control with our brain over our body, except for when you get tapped on your knee, right? You get tapped on your knee, the doctor does that thing, and your leg jerks out, right? That's, a, that's, that's, that's one of the only evidences of a decentralized nervous system that we exhibit in humans, right? So flip that and realize that almost all trout fishing, and a lot of the times in fly fishing too, that the trout's teeny, teeny, tiny brain has no ability to stop itself from lashing out at food, okay? And that's what all spin fishing with lures relies on, right? Is the decentralized nervous system of a fish, okay? The reason that we call trout a smart fish species is because their, their brain is ever so slightly because they've evolved to eat uh, surface insects in, in avian predator environments is to have the ability to choose, right? So a trout has an ever so slightly more ability to choose whether to eat or not than, than most other fish species, okay? That's why they're interesting and why it's fun. That's why dry fly fishing works. And that's why straight line presentations are, well, that's why we get to brag as fly fishermen about it, right? It's because when you get that perfect cast out there and you get that straight line and you get that, 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 that trout to eat up on the surface, you've done it without relying or leaning on that decentralized nervous system, you have tricked the trout's brain. Okay, so, uh, and I know that most of you I'm preaching to the converted, but for the half of you that I'm not, just remember that straight line is the single most important thing, whether you're fishing a dry or a wet or, uh, or a nymph, right? That's the single most important component to your presentation is to do whatever you can to go to get into a straight line. Um, and, 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 and while I'm on that fact too, the, the other, the other thing you need to do that. And if, and it's the, one of the first things I'll look for in an experienced angler, when I have them on the water and something that I'll implore you guys to go out and do is figure out how to get slack into your casts. Gentlemen, I have this all the time. The goal on a cast is not to lay all of your line out and have a nice straight line. When your line hits the water, if your line hits the water and there's no slack in it, there's no mend in the world. It's going to give you a drag-free drift. You got to get slack in your line. All right. And think of it like the tennis ball, right? You throw a tennis ball up in the air. There's that moment that it stops. There's zero energy and it starts to come back to you. All right. That's what's supposed to happen in a good dry fly cast. That fly needs to stop somewhere over the surface of the water and jerk back to you a little bit. All right. That little jerk back that you get, that's slack in your line. As long as there's slack in your line, you can mend without imparting motion to your fly. All right. So hit the hit the hit the YouTube, look at some of those casting things, and learn how to cast with slack in your line. And that goes across the board. It's the same thing with it's even the same. Honestly, it's even the same thing with tight line nymphing, right? Even tight line nymphing, you still need to get your 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 fly down. And flies don't sink on a top line, right? You need to have slack in there. It's the same thing. It's a universal rule of fly fishing. So slack and straight lines. And those would be the two things I'd say to, to sort of go work on a little bit. My, my, my two cents, you know. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of happy to sort of start winding down my, what seems to have been a way too long of a monologue through all this. Um, if anybody wants or has questions, uh, it's a good time to sort of shoot those out, but, um, uh, but I will say, uh, uh, again, thanks for having me. Um, the Esopus is a really incredible fishery. If nothing else, uh, it is, and the Skahari too, but the Skahari is just, it's a warm, it's a very warm fishery. It's the all, as I said earlier, it's the only fishery that didn't benefit from the reservoir system because they only got a, a res at the bottom. So there's no influx, but this area of the Catskills, if you're used to going to the West, come to the east side of the Catskills. The, the, every inch of the river has a mountain view that's breathtaking. It'll be some of the most beautiful fishing you've ever done in your life. You have one of the most incredible self-sustained wild rainbow trout populations. An eight inch rainbow here fights like a 12 inch stock brown. You'll absolutely love it. Please stop by the shop. Um, and also too, if, if for time reasons or whatever, reach out to me, please uh, reach out to me. Um, for questions and stuff like that through, through email or social media. Um, I'm always happy to answer. I, you know, obviously I love talking about this place. It's really special to me. Um, and I hope to make it special to you guys too. Um, that first question there, Todd? Something about the, uh, uh, below the reservoir. Yeah. It, it I came out of the Ashokan. 
Below the Ashokan is, is predominantly uh, warm water fishery, right? So, um, you know, bass and carp. And a lot of people, you know, really enjoy that. Um, uh, but it's uh, for uh, the, there's no, um, there's no cold water release device uh, here, the way that the other reservoirs were sort of designed. Um, so you, the, the lower Asopus, it's, it's, it's what they call a waste channel. They're taking water off the top, actually. Um, <clears throat> so they, they do not benefit from cold water releases in the lower Asopus. How is the bass fishing on it? Have you fished bass? Oh, awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, every, you know, everyone, it's, you know, it's funny. Since the rainbows really started to rebound, and also because the last couple of years, you know, the portal, uh, historically, sometimes the portal, they, they'll run it really high. Um, and, but they've been doing work on the portal um, to actually increase their ability to manage flows for the betterment of the, of the, of the, of the fishery, actually. Um, if you don't know, uh, so when, 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 when the sun hits the surface of the water, of still water, uh, that hot water pushes the turbidity down. So ultimately you get, it's not just the weight of the turbidity. And also just to clarify in the esophis, the, the turbidity here is, is technically, it's not even mud and it's not, um, it's not contaminant, right? It's just clay, suspended clay particles, right? And that's different from fishery to fishery. Sometimes it's a contaminant, sometimes it's mud, sometimes it's clay. Anyway, um, the, uh, uh, what was I saying? Oh, about that, we were talking about bass. Um, yeah, so the, uh, yeah, the, lower the portal, they've been the doing lower work senses. on the portal, which has capped the flows on the portal, which have also made, I think, it is a fantastic, uh, very s far slower release of that cold water resource. As I said earlier, the Schaharie is not nearly as big as the other reservoirs. So if they, in a, in a drought situation, if they let all that cold water through, then you're kind of out. Um, uh, but anyway, the, uh, I haven't really fished the reservoir too, too much the last couple of years because the Yosopas has been so good. Usually in uh, August, when it gets warm, if we've run out of cold water from the, from the, uh, the portal, uh, you know, we'll start fishing the reservoir much, um, so uh, a bit more. Um, but it's an it's, it's a incredible smallmouth fishery, um, some largemouth, uh, and... Um, you know, we've yet to go out with depth charge sinking streamer lines because it's a really big reservoir, but the bait guys uh, can consistently pull 10 plus pound trout out of the Ashokan. It's uh, pretty amazing. Um, it's obviously, especially the browns, they are just, they're just behemoth. You'll think it's a faked photo. Yeah. Did you Question. Did I miss a question or was that a goodbye? I only get like the first couple words. Yeah. Someone said they had to go get some uh, some dinner. Good Any questions for Todd? Oh, is there, let me see it here. Um, oh, there it is. I didn't see we could do this. All right. Oh, back to some, there was a question here about, um, about CFS. Uh, generally speaking too, on the Esopus, uh, if you're seeing CFS uh, below, you know, I, 800 to 1000 is still pretty fishable for CFS here. Uh, and what you'll wanna look at if you're taking notes is the, the, um, the Cold Brook station here which is the, 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 um, the lowest station <clears throat> that we have here. Um, so up, up to like, uh, up to 800 is still um, good. And, and when you get to like a thousand, you're, you're, you wanna play the edges, but uh, the Esopus is in the, So that's the other thing, if I forgot to mention, the Esopus is just, just accessed legally. There's like one person on the entire river in the main part, and I, I generally refer to the main part as from the portal down. Uh, I just, I just, I don't, I don't talk too much uh, about above the portal. There is more private property up there, mm -hmm. but it's also until you, until you know, I don't talk about it because it's you don't have the influx of cold water, right? So if people aren't walking around with a thermometer up there at the right time of year, they can do a lot of damage. And 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 with the audience, sort of the 
we have for, for the company, it's, it's a lot of people. So I don't just talk freely. So generally speaking, right, I'm talking about from the portal down. Um, but that's, uh, you, can, you, can, you can access 100% of the, you, sorry, you can fish 100% of the river from the portal down as long as you access legally, right? So, um, and there's tons of pull offs So there's, there's just, there's always water to fish. And that's another thing that's interesting about, you know, our river has gotten a little bit um, more busy lately, but just keep, um, um, just keep driving around, <laughs> right? Just, just find a place, right? That doesn't have uh, as, as, as many cars, but that's the other thing too. You can, you know, most of the spots on the main part of the river, uh, there's a lot of water, um, you know, it's a medium to large sized river. So just cause you see two cars doesn't mean that you can't still roll in there. Um, so uh, please do, what level of turbidity do you think we should expect on the surface when the season opens? That's still, um, that's still rarely a little up in the air. Um, oh, that's Ben, hey Ben. Um, uh, I, I, I'm, it's gonna be, I think it's going to be up, um, but usually in the beginning of the year, when the um, portal and uh, um, when the portal is releasing the amount of water that they want to move downstream, it's usually up anyway because the rivers flows are usually up in the very beginning of the season, and that's another reason why um, fishing doesn't generally turn on here until May. Um, but uh, but as I said before, I think. Um, I'm still like, I'm trying to talk to some of the guys at uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension here and DEP uh, to get a full assessment of what, you know, how much turbidity do we think is coming. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll be making a lot of posts about that as we move into the season, what the real, what the real impacts are going to be. Um, but uh, <clears throat> the other short answer to that, and again, because we're a crew, a crew of Trout Unlimited people is um, if you want to catch fish in the beginning of the season, you should be on the tributaries anyway because they're going to warm up, right? So you fish the tribs in the beginning of the season uh, if you want to catch, if you really want to catch trout. Um, cool, cool. Well, uh, again, thanks to everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, thanks for Thank having you. me. That's great, Todd. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say awesome. too, I, um, I'm going to, I just finally, I bit the bullet. I'm going to do, I'm going to do a live stream once a month now. Um, it's the third Monday of the month. So that'll, that'll be going up on, um, on, uh, on Facebook and Instagram, whatever. Uh, I'm going to probably do it on Instagram. That's where most of our audience is. Um, but I'll figure out if there's a way to do it on both simultaneously. Um, so, uh, if you have questions, uh, specific to the Sopus or specific to angling or otherwise, feel free to hop on that. I'm going to be doing that. And the first one's going to be actually next Monday. Um, and, uh, I hope to see some of you guys there. So, uh, so thanks again. Yeah. I, um, can't thank you enough, Todd, for joining us tonight. It's, it's a really unique river and hopefully folks were able to, you know, um, you know, take some information away about it and maybe we can, uh, get some more people interested in checking it out this year. <clears throat> hopefully, hopefully what happened over Christmas isn't going to be too damaging. You know, that's, that's the, that's the hope. Well, the, the, the big thing too is, and again, I mean, I've seen a storm twice as bad as this and the fish always come back. Like I said, this fishery just, it's just a confluence of, 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 of good environment, environmental conditions for trout. Um, so, uh, and, and especially for big trout right after a storm, because all the little ones have been washed away. Right. So yeah. we won't be getting stock trout and there won't be little trout. It's just going to be big trout heaven. The few that are going to be there are just going to get fat as hogs. We're going to get some <laughs> torpedoes growing in that river this year. That's, that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, so uh, yeah. so bring your bring your bring your game and nice. uh, size, size down on your tippet. <laughs> <laughs> Let me clarify. Did you guys move the shop to you're in downtown now, right? In Phoenicia, uh, right next to Woodstock Brewing. Um, OK, so you're still, gonna, you're still there then. On Good. the main road. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I usually try to go out a couple times a year, folks. So if uh if this pandemic business ever gets behind us, you know, I'm I'm more than happy to to cart another angler with me if um we ever get to a, a better place with everything. So I'd always uh, welcome someone to join me to I like to spend a couple days out there in the spring and fall and usually bring my wife out in the fall and 
we, I mean, it's just a beautiful area. You know, we go down to the rail trail and, and I um, spend a couple of days on the Asopus and, you know, there's good places to eat and good beer. And so it's a really beautiful area. So um, thanks again, everybody for joining us. Thanks again to Todd. Um, just keep an eye out, I guess, on the Facebook page and on our Instagram. Once we figure out what we're doing, <laughs> moving forward into the spring, we will, uh, we'll make sure we announce things, but we like to keep everyone on their toes. So um, again, thanks so much. Thanks, Todd. Everybody be safe, be healthy, and um, hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. Have a great night. Side lunch. Bye-bye.